The Buddha was a member of the noble warrior caste. In fact, it's said that of the past seven Buddhas, only one was not a member of the warrior caste. And warrior sens sensibility can be found throughout his teachings. You see with the images he gives comparing a meditator to a, an archer, a soldier facing an, an approaching army. Even elephants and horses trained in battle. And not just in the imagery, it's in the content as well. You look at the Noble Eightfold Path, and it bears a lot of similarities to the education of a soldier. You learn the right view about how to fight, the right motivation, the resolve to come out victorious and do whatever is needed. You have a code of honor and, and right speech, right action, right livelihood. And right mindfulness keeps in mind what you've learned. Keep in mind how to analyze things so you know which tactics to apply. What's most striking, of course, is that the Buddhist teachings are strategic, just like a soldier's or a warrior's. There's a story they tell in Thai history, and the Thais love to tell this because the Burmese come out looking kind of dumb. But there was two princes of the Thai royal house who were taken to Burma. They captured. The idea being that Thailand was going to be a vassal state, so they were trained to be good vassals to the Burmese king. And they got into a competition with the Burmese viceroy. And there was one time there was a bandit with large forces that was holed up in a mountain fortress and was out robbing the countryside. And so they decided to send the princes in to, to deal with it. First they sent the viceroy. And his tactic was just to take a large army up the road to the mountain, and the bandit chief drove him back down again. Then it was the turn of the Thai princes. So what they did was they had a small army that came up the mountain, up the major road. And that pulled the forces of the bandit chief down. And then their larger army went up the other side, up around the back, seized the fortress, seized the bandit chief. It's because they thought strategically that they won. And as we're practicing here, we have to think strategically too. There's a passage where Ananda talks about three things that are eventually going to be giving up. In fact, we're giving up our need for these things as a result of the practice, but we need to use them in the meantime. And they parallel the things that you have to provide for soldiers. There's food, there's desire, and there's confidence. Food, of course, as Napoleon said, an army has to march on its stomach. Our food here, of course, is the concentration, getting a sense of well-being. Where are you going to get the sense of well-being from? It's those five aggregates. We know eventually we're going to have to give them up. But first you get some use out of them. After all, they do have their uses. Why throw them away? And if our aim is the deathless, you have to realize you can't use the deathless as a path. There's nothing you can use about it at all. It's not a means to anything. You have to use the means that you've got. So you focus on the form of the body, focus on the breath, as you feel it. And breathe in a way that gives rise to feelings of well-being and ease. Hold the perception of the breath in mind and try to adjust the perception so that it allows you to breathe in a way that's really comfortable. You have to question your perceptions if your breathing feels cramped or tight. Maybe you're perceiving the breath in the wrong way. What other ways could you picture it to yourself? Experiment. And as you're thinking about the breath and evaluating it, that's fabrication, and your consciousness is aware of all these things. So you've got the five aggregates right there, and you learn how to turn them into part of the path. This is your nourishment. 
without the well-being that comes from the concentration, the path gets pretty dry pretty fast. And as for the three characteristics, don't apply them too quickly. There's a passage in the commentaries when they talk about how the three characteristics are the Buddha's categorical teaching. In other words, it's true across the board. But the Buddha didn't treat them that way. There are only two teachings in the whole canon that he treats as categorical. One is the Four Noble Truths, and the other is the principle that skillful qualities should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. Those two teachings are true across the board. The three characteristics, as the Buddha showed, should be applied only at certain times and certain places. There was once a young monk who was asked by a wanderer from another sect what the results of karma were, and the monk said, stress. He went back to the Buddha and asked if he'd given the right answer, and the Buddha said, no. When you're asked about karma, you talk about how skillful karma leads to pleasure, unskillful karma leads to pain. And one of the other monks piped up and said, well, wasn't he thinking about the fact that all feelings are stressful? And the Buddha said, essentially, well, that was not the time or place for that teaching. So an important part of strategy is knowing which teachings to use when. And not jumping the gun or it's trying to skip over things. So when you're practicing concentration, okay, apply the three characteristics or any other type of contemplation that would give rise to dispassion to the things that would pull you out of concentration. But while you are trying to develop the concentration, you don't focus on the fact that it's inconstant, because in the very beginning it's all too obviously inconstant. And this is where the other two factors come in. You know, soldiers need motivation in order to fight. And the motivation comes down to two things. One is the desire to win, and two is the confidence that you can. The desire here that Ananda talked about was hearing that other people have achieved an awakening, and you want that too. Of course, the desire has to be focused properly, not just on the goal, but on the means to the goal. So you focus here, each breath coming in, each breath coming in. It's in developing the path that the goal is found. The path and the goal are not the same thing, but it's by focusing totally on the path that the goal will appear right here. So there is that intimate connection. And as for the confidence, it's a quality that in Pali is called conceit, mahana. It doesn't mean being conceited, but it means having the confidence that other people can do this. They're human beings. I'm a human being. They can do it. Why can't I? Ultimately, we want to get rid of desire and conceit, but we have to use them on the path. If you don't have the desire to get to the end of the path, you're just going to lie down on the path. And we know what happens when people lie down on paths. They get run over. They get trampled. And if you don't have the confidence, you give up even before you've tried. So as a soldier, you need your food. You need your desire. You need your confidence or conceit. You use these things strategically. That conceit there is a sense of self. It's a healthy sense of self. You want to develop that. The desire is part of right effort. And the food is right concentration. So all these elements of the path are strategic. You learn to use them when they're appropriate, learn to put them aside when they're not. And when the, the job is done, then you put everything aside. But until then, you've got to hold on. There are things you've got to develop, things you've got to work at. And there are times when it's going to get discouraging. That's when you have to learn how to give yourself good pep talks to strengthen that sense of confidence, strengthen the sense of desire. When you're feeling weak, okay, look for where you can find food. If you can't get the food of right concentration, learn to develop the food of generosity, 
the food of virtue. All these things are nourishing to the heart. Reflection on your generosity, reflection on your virtue as well. They help to give rise to that sense of confidence and the sense of honor that we're doing something really noble here. And it's important to remember that the nobles were not just men, they were women as well. If you were a woman and a member of the noble warrior caste, you had to learn a lot of these attitudes as well. You knew the men of the family were going to danger, and you had to learn skills too. The women of the noble warriors were the surgeons. Husbands would come home, their brothers or sons would come home with arrows in them, and it was the, the duty of the, the women to get the arrows out. So they had to have a fighting spirit too. So it's good to remember that the Buddha's knowledge is warrior knowledge, i.e. knowledge of skills to be used in difficult situations so you can come out victorious. Back in the old days they made a distinction between warrior knowledge and scribal knowledge. Scribe knowledge was just the knowledge of words. And of course, warrior knowledge needs to use words, but it's words for the purpose of understanding something so you can approach difficult situations with skill. You keep those words in mind, you keep the instructions in mind, that's the function of right mindfulness. But in particular, these qualities of right effort and right concentration, those are your warrior strategies. And it's worth your while to develop them as skills.